This is Christianity 101, the podcast connecting busy people with Jesus. I'm your host, Rick Grundy. This is episode five. I was working at Canadian Tire Pit Stop when I was, oh, I don't know, I guess 18, 17, something like that. And while I was working during the summer, as my friends are all out playing somewhere, doing something, I was at Canadian Tire Pit Stop working, and and it was a slow day, because it was summer, nobody wanted to get an oil change, it was a slow day, so my friends who are working with me and I were outside the bays, we're just looking around, enjoying the summer sun as it's beating down on us while we're in our, our full uniforms, and we just happened to notice this guy driving into the parking lot. He was going rather slow, and we saw that he was looking around he was kind of looking at the pit stop looking at the garage bay looking at the pit stop looking at the garage bay and i think that he was trying to figure out where the mechanic shop was because the pit stop looked like like free and easy access and just get in there and get out but i think that he was kind of struggling with that because he knew that the service bay was actually somewhere else and he was completely distracted so distracted even though he was going slow so distracted that he wasn't looking forward didn't have a He didn't know where he was going, and he T-boned a parked car. He just casually drove right into the side of a parked car. And my friends and I are watching this, and we're just, we're looking at him, and we're looking at each other, and we're saying to ourselves, did we really just see that happen? When we're distracted, okay, when we're distracted, here's what's at risk. We may not reach our goal, but even more than that, when we're distracted, We may actually get hurt along the way. You know, Christianity can be a little like people driving their their cars. If you stay focused, you're going to arrive alive. If you get distracted, you may not arrive at all. That's what's at stake, and that's the point today's text is making. Over the next couple of episodes we're continuing to look at hebrews and we're exploring this theme of what's a christian to do because the next few the next few passages in hebrews it really helps us to explore the work behind christianity are we putting enough effort into christianity are we putting the effort in christianity that actually takes to be a christian i hope we're gaining an understanding of the pastor of hebrews he loves his church he's concerned Uh, that he's about to lose his church to apostasy, which is a really big deal, that they're going to turn their backs on Christianity, go back to Judaism. But, But even, which shouldn't be a big deal, but is even the same kind of big deal, is apathy. Apathy, just treating life too casually, treating Christianity too casually it's just a big as big a deal as as apostasy is one of the things in the pastor's mind is how distracted his church has become when jesus is just one option among many and when there are many options then jesus himself becomes the distraction for us so this episode is based on hebrews chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 why don't you take a moment to read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Click on that, that text in, in, the, uh, in the show notes there because it links you over to Bible Gateway where you can read it yourself. Take a moment to read it, and then I'll continue. The point of this episode is to look at this particular thought. How believers slay the three-headed monster of distraction. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 3, 1 to 6 to figure that out. We're not what the first congregation was. We're not. But we can be what they were. Our world is far more distracting than theirs. The first congregation, the the original readers of Hebrews, was ever. We are far more affluent than them. We have many more options We are overstimulated with advertisements and with personal devices. Who doesn't have a tablet or a smartphone these days? Distraction isn't the sin that apostasy is, but did you know that both distraction and apostasy can lead to the same result? Did you hear that? That's the pastor's concern here. Distraction, 
apathy and apostasy can end the same way. And that's a big deal that the pastor wants to tell his church. And that's the reason why he's spending so much time talking about how Jesus is superior. Jesus is the first and the best of all creation. The only thing that has any eternal benefit. Yet we are so easily distracted. We so easily put ourselves at risk. So let me just give you a heads up about where I'm going in this episode here. Here's how we slay the three-headed monster of distraction. I want to talk about attacking its identity, attacking its mind, and attacking its activity, okay? To slay the three-headed monster of distraction, we're going to talk about identity, uh, mind, thoughts, and, and activity. Here we go. First of all, to defeat the monster of distraction, we need to keep Jesus at the center of... I'm not going to finish that sentence just yet. Let me start with the verse here. I'm taking this from verse 1, 3 verse 1, which says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Can I just comment that our destination is glory? Let's let's not get our eyes off of that. Let, let's remember what's at stake here. Let's remember where God is bringing us to. The destination is glory. The text says heavenly calling. I've got a little girl. She's not two yet. Her name's Vanessa, and she's a real cutie. We are having, we, my wife and I, are having a hard time feeding her. Uh, she's just in that, in that phase right now where food and sleep, apparently, are a distraction. She would rather be playing. She would rather be doing anything else because life is fun. Life is a party because she's got three older siblings, siblings who play with her a lot, and she loves life, so food just gets in the way. I'm not like that. I think that life could tone down a little bit so I could eat and sleep a little bit more, but that's not her. She, food is a distraction, but she loves outside. So the goal of feeding time is no longer food. The goal of feeding time is outside. As a matter of fact, that was one of her first 10, 20 words, one of her first words. Outside, she said, side. She always sees the kids going to school. She never is allowed to. So she, she, she knows the word outside. So she gives like side. Every time we cook something, well, not every time. Uh, lots of times when we cook something, when it's lunch, when it's dinner, she'll see the food, she'll point to the door and say, side. Because it was, she's telling us if you, if we want her to eat that, then she wants to be outside, and then she'll comply. Here's the point. Here's the point of the illustration. Here, she will eat only if we remember what her goal is. Her goal is to be outside, because that's where the big kids get to go, and that's where she wants to go. That's that's her goal. Let's talk about our goal, God's goal for us. The text is heavenly calling. Jesus' destination for you is glory that's that's heaven that's eternity that's everything that that god is bringing us to when it's all said and done where are we at we are in glory and i'm not entirely sure what that looks like and it's not it's not really been revealed too clearly in the bible but it's going to look wonderful because we know that first john tells us we will be face to face with god forever we will <laughs> It will see him as he really is. Uh, we will be swimming in our backyard pools with the Holy Spirit, maybe. Maybe we'll be riding our bikes in Jesus' biker gang, riding on streets of gold, maybe. I don't know what it looks like. I just know that it's going to be wonderful. What that looks like hasn't been revealed, but we know we're going to be like Jesus because we'll see him as he truly is. We need to be holy like he is holy for that to be our reality. Okay, but wait a minute glory now. Now that's a destination, but glory isn't really a destination. It's not. Glory is actually, it's all tied in around an identity. We can't get to glory if we don't have our identity cards. If there's something wrong with our identity, we're not going to get to glory. Glory is reserved for the children of God. Glory will be filled with friends of Jesus. Glory is a forever friendship. So when we're talking about glory, we're really talking about identity. It really, it really, glory hangs in the balance of identity. The text calls this a heavenly calling. Our calling is to live forever as a friend of God. And we prepare for that heavenly calling with our earthly calling, which is to be 
a friend of God right now. Your destination is not determined by what you do, but by who you are. And I think that's an important point for the pastor of Hebrews because it looks like the church forgot who they were. They forgot how important their allegiance to Jesus was. They forgot how special it is to be called a child of God. They forgot what it was that gave them the identity of a child of God. The destination is glory, and glory is a permanent identity. We're identified as children of God, as friends of Jesus. Now, your focus can change your destination. And this is what's breaking the, the pastor of Hebrews' heart here. The text says, fix your thoughts. Where glory is a forever friendship with God, then your thoughts and my thoughts need to be on our existing friendship with God. Now, the church of Hebrews were not thinking about their friendship with God. They were thinking that glory could be achieved through many options. At least that's what it looks like. Jesus had become an option because they didn't believe that glory was a friendship with Jesus. That starts right now. They lost their focus on their identity as Jesus' friend. And I know it's, it's, it's kind of hard to see that in Hebrews, but here's just an example. They believed that they could return to Judaism, which is one of the reasons why the pastor through the book of Hebrews lets us know that, that the old covenant is obsolete because it's been replaced by the newer model, the new covenant. They wanted to ret return to Judaism because for them it wasn't about relationship. It was about uh, religious affiliation or, act or activity. It's essential to remember who we are. Your Christianity doesn't hang in the balance of your activity, although your behavior certainly has consequences. Your Christianity begins with identity. We identify ourselves as sinful. We identify Jesus as God. Who has the answer? Then we place our faith in him and identify ourselves as children of God, friends of Jesus. Keep Jesus at the center of who you are. I just finished the sentence there that I started with. Keep Jesus at the center of who you are, the text says, apostle and high priest. Apostle, um, that means that Jesus is the man who was sent from God to proclaim God's message. There it is. Priest. That means that Jesus is the man who brings God and people together. High priest, Jesus has become that man who forever keeps people in relationship with God. And of course, Jesus is, is also God. So Jesus has made us into the family of God, eternal friends with Jesus. That's something we should never get distracted from. There is nothing else that can identify us as a friend of God and lead us to glory. There is no other option that can take the place of our high priest. Jesus is not an option. He is the only thing that identifies us as a child of God. He's all that we are. He needs to be all that we are. When our identity determines our activity, distractions are far less distracting. I can get really distracted by, uh, by many things if I forget who I am. If I forget I'm a child of God, if I don't hold on to, to on how meaningful that friendship with Jesus is, if, if that meaningfulness of the friendship with Jesus, if I'm not holding on to that and I forget about the, him being my identity, then, then I could open myself up to following many, many other options. My identity and your identity has to be clear. When our identity determ determines what we do, it determines our activity, distractions, far less distracting, and then apathy will be less of a problem for us. To slay the three-headed monster of distraction, secondly, keep Jesus at the center of... I'm not going to finish that yet. I'm going to read verses 2 to 6 first. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house is greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. That's the first part of verse 6 here, then I'll stop. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. Have you been keeping your eye on social media and have you been tracking the beer can conspiracy? 
there's um as as the Jays were were playing, uh, somebody threw a beer can into the uh, into the field while uh, while the guy from the Orioles was trying to catch the ball. Anyways, um, as as everybody's trying to figure out who it was, cameras all went to this one spot on the bleachers where this guy is sort of being stared at by all the people around him, and his picture has been circulating on Facebook and and other social media, and people are thinking, yeah, he's the guy that threw the beer can. And the police say, yeah, we, we have identified somebody who, who was probably the one who threw the beer can. However, however, it looks like some better evidence is also popping up, showing that it may have actually been perhaps a blonde girl who was there threw the beer can and then ducked down where nobody could see here, see her. Now, here's the thing. So many people are, um, are considering that, yeah, it's definitely the guy... <laughs> who threw the can because that was the first piece of evidence that came our way because it was the first piece of evidence that came our way we're thinking that's definitely the bad guy and so when this when these other pieces of evidence come our way showing pixelated video clips that yeah there was definitely somebody beside him we're less likely to give that any credibility and that's less likely to um, to get our attention because that's the thing about evidence the first thing we hear tends to be what we lean on as truth. We hear a report from somebody. We hear a rumor from somebody, even if they're gossiping. And then it's the first thing we hear, so so we tend to say, okay, well, that must be truth. And then when something else comes our way, we reject it because we receive the first thing as truth, and the second thing is really competing with that truth. Well, okay, so that's getting complicated, but the original readers of Hebrews have this problem. Moses was a hero. And for them, they're thinking that Moses is the greatest hero. And we see this Moses, we see the, uh, this Moses comparison here. The only Bible the Church of Hebrews had was the Old Testament. Well, guess what? Moses was seen as the architect of the Old Covenant. In the past, when I was reading Hebrews, I had no idea why angels and Moses were comparisons for Jesus. I didn't have a clue. Like, angels? Why are we discussing angels? Moses? Why are we discussing Moses here? Of course Jesus is the greatest thing. Well, you know what? This this comparison, these comparisons, they weren't for us originally. They're for the original church. They had meaning to the original church. In the pastor's church, Moses was the voice of authority. It's the first voice that they had grown familiar with. The Greeks also were influenced by by their only Bible, which was the Old Testament, and the Jews showing how influential and authoritative Moses was. Actually, Moses was given more authority than Jesus was in this particular church, or so so it looked. Now, that may sound strange to us. Some people believe that Moses and the Old Covenant have no more relevance because we live in a time of grace. Some famous preachers tell their congregations to ignore the Old Testament entirely because it has no more relevance. Yeah, and I don't know if that's where you you are. I mean, but but chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, is because you know you don't see the New Testament, and the Old Testament is competing with each other. You see the New Testament as well. Of course, I'm going to listen to Jesus first. Of course, this is. I'm not going to listen to Moses first. Jesus is way superior. The original readers had a kink in their think. Did you hear that? The original readers had a kink in their think. Their understanding was causing their distraction. They were distracted because they believed something that wasn't true of Jesus or of Moses. Wrong beliefs can be a problem. Jesus is superior. We see the word right here, Jesus. We see that that, that the pastor writing Hebrews gives us three comparisons to, to show us how much more superior Jesus is over Moses. We see the phrase here, the builder of a house has greater honor. Moses served in the house, and that means that he served Israel as God laid the foundation of the Old Covenant. Moses was that spokesperson back then. Jesus, however, being God, built the house. That means that Jesus is the one establishing a relationship with God in the first place. So the builder, Jesus, is superior. The text also says, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. Well, that's amazing. That means that Moses was pointing toward Jesus, saying, this is who Jesus is going to be. This is how to recognize it. This is what he's going to say. Moses was telling telling about something greater to come, that one day people would hear from God on their own. Moses was pointing to the Son. Jesus is the Son being pointed to. So Jesus 
the fulfillment of what Moses was pointing to, saying something bigger's coming, here it is. Well, the bigger, the bigger, better thing has come, and that's Jesus. He's greater than Moses. Another, t- another passage says, Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. Moses was a servant. Jesus is the son. And I think that that's plainly simple. That's that third point. Now, here, here's the pastor's big idea here. Here's the pastor's point, as far as I can figure it out. Keep Jesus at the center of what you think. These verses point to a mindset that the congregation held. Their mindset lended itself to distraction. For example, because their hero was Moses, apostasy was a viable option. As a matter of fact, they weren't thinking it was apostasy at all because Moses was their hero. If our mindset is on anything other than Jesus, then we will be distracted. And if we're distracted, we are not growing into relationship with Jesus. Actually, we could be moving out of our relationship with Jesus. So the pastor's point is that our mindset needs to be set on Jesus. If we're preoccupied with anything else, we run the risk of losing everything. Apathy may be subtle, but it can be as deadly as apostasy. So when our think is in sync with Jesus, distractions are far less distracting. When my mindset is is focused on Jesus, when when I'm heading in his direction, when I'm focused on building the relationship, I'm mindful that every single moment is an opportunity for me to draw closer to God, then distractings distractions are far less distracting. But when I'm thinking about other things, most often that are not Jesus, then distractions are going to get very distracting. And if I'm not thinking about Jesus a whole lot, then then apathy is more likely to be one of my problems. But when our think is in sync with Jesus, distractions are less distracting. To slay the three-headed monster distraction, here's the third one. Keep Jesus at the center of... And of course, I'm not going to tell you what that is now. Just like the other two, I'm going to tell you in a moment. Verse 6, And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Do you remember that the quote from the movie, If you build it, he will come. <laughs> Whisper that was in the cornfield. That's for, I think it's called Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner. Some kind of ghost of baseball heroes made Kevin Costner a promise. And that promise had the word if in it. It was a condition. If you were to build a baseball field, then people would come. And one in particular person would come. He had to build the thing first. And then the people will come. If you build it, he will come. There is a condition here. There is a condition. That's the point of that illustration I, want, I was sharing with you. The word is if. We're his house if. Please remember the pastor's great concern, church apathy. He's losing his church. So don't let this word if bother you too much. Jesus isn't looking for opportunities to keep you from glory. On the contrary, he's given us an entire sermon right here in Hebrews because he wants to see us there. But we do have to be mindful of the conditions. The pastor is reminding his church that they are only part of the church if they meet the condition of continued faithfulness. And that condition is met by what they do. Identity with Jesus absolutely comes first. But after we have identified with Jesus, there is certainly something to do. They need to act like children of God who are in alignment with Jesus. And they need to stop acting like Jesus isn't a priority. They need to stop acting like they're about to return to Judaism. So uh, let me finish the sentence now. Keep Jesus at the center of all you do. Faith is the seed. Activity is faith in full bloom. How do you like that? I thought that was kind of clever. As I, you might not think that's clever. If you think that's clever, then write me a note in the, in the comments saying, yeah, that was kind of clever. Faith is the seed. Activity is faith in full bloom. The pastor of Hebrews saw his church get less and less active about their faith. As they grew less active, they were more distracted. As their faith became harder to see, it was easier to see how distracted they were. Jesus is our only hope, isn't he? The call to the original church is our call too. Keep Jesus at the center of all we do. When our faith is our activity, 
distractions are less distracting. If I'm not focused on Jesus, if I'm not doing thing for Jesus, things for Jesus, then I am then I'm distracted. And if I'm distracted, then apathy is a concern for me. But when our faith is our activity, distractions are far less distracting. Let me close with this. How believers slay the three-headed monster of distraction. Let me just sum it up for you to keep it simple here. How believers slay the three-headed monster of distraction. Here it is. Keep Jesus at the center of who you are, what you think, and all you do. Okay, that was a lot of words. The podcast is going 25, 26 minutes, almost 30, something like that. And, and I want to leave you with something that's memorable. I want to leave you with a, with a really good summary of this whole passage. And I've got five words for you just to summarize this, to hold on to until the next time you come back and, and, and uh, engage one of my podcasts. Here it is, five words to summarize this whole episode so you can take it with you. Keep Jesus at the center. God bless you. I'll see you next Wednesday when a new episode is going to be released. See you next time.